This is Roger Brewer with John Peart in the Hawaii Department of Health. This is the fourth in a series of four webinars on the use of decision unit multi-increment sampling methods to improve site investigation reliability for contaminated soil and sediment. The first webinar, John discussed the importance of systematic planning, especially the importance of spending more time up front understanding the site that you need to investigate before you go out and start collecting samples. In particular, is reviews of historical data, public records for the site, but also visiting the site is very critical. And it, if possible, interviewing uh, people who used to work there and getting an idea of where there might be suspect areas of contamination. <coughs> in the second webinar, and I went over more details of decision units and how to designate decision units at sites. This isn't really a, a big difference from what we've always been doing in the past. Anytime we go to a site, we typically try to identify suspect areas of contamination, and then from a risk assessment standpoint, we might try to focus on potential exposure areas and designate those areas for characterization. The big difference under MIS DU approaches is you, in the field, you physically draw a line around those areas, and then you're going to collect a single multi-increment sample from each one of those decision unit areas and make decisions based on that. It's really critical as part of this uh, DU designation to get it right the first time so that you want to set your decision units up so that you're comfortable making decisions on the data that come back without having to go back and resample the, the individual decision units or split them up into smaller and smaller decision units. Sometimes you have to do that. You might get surprised with really large decision units that you thought would be clean. They come up contaminated, but you want to avoid that as possible. In the third webinar, you know, I discussed the concept of sampling theory pointed out that the sampling theory is, is pretty unknown in the environmental industry. It's very widely used in other industries like agriculture, mining, and such. But it's really a new concept, a new idea for a lot of the environmental industry. So it really focused on the limitations of discrete sampling data and how if you collect samples side by side, you can get radically different numbers in laboratories, testing different pinches or spoonfuls, aliquots from individual samples can be radically different. So in, in the end, the, the, the data that you get from the laboratory isn't reliably representative of the sample you sent. And the sample you collected really isn't reliably representative of the area that you collected it from. So that's the first thing to remember in looking into this approach. And before you move on to DUMIS approaches, is just understanding the limitations of discrete sample data. We also discuss limitations of discrete sample data, even in risk assessments, where you don't really know the field precision of a single set of discrete samples collected from a target exposure area. We demonstrated through our field research, you can go back to the same area, collect another set of discrete samples, and come up with a radically different mean, or even 95th percent UCL. So these were discussed in, in detail in the DU characterization webinar. Today, we're moving on to the last final webinar, field implementation of DU MIS methods. This will be presented again by John Peart, and it really gets into the, the nitty-gritty details of how to collect samples in the field, how to designate DUs, and avoid the need to, for multiple revocalizations. So with that, I'll pass it on to John. Hello and welcome. This is John, and as Roger just mentioned, I will be discussing the field implementation issues in today's Decision Unit Multi-Increment Sampling, or DUMIS, webinar. In our online technical guidance manual, aspects of field collection of DUMIS samples are covered in Section 5, with specific subsections addressing collection of surface soil samples, subsurface soil samples, collecting samples from stockpiles, collecting samples for VOC analyses, sediment sampling, as well as other field prep and documentation details. I also want to acknowledge up front all the good work of environmental consultants working on DUMIS investigations in Hawaii over the last eight years, 
who have helped to put in practice and refine the field techniques that will be discussed. Field experience is key to learning and understanding decision units and multi-increment sampling investigation approaches. And as we have stressed in earlier webinars, initial planning and preparation are very important in designing and implementing good DUMIS investigations. After gathering any documented historical information pertinent to the site, we start work with a reconnaissance visit to the site to walk the site and review in the field any important historical maps, photos, or other information we have gathered. We also discuss and sketch the location, size, and depth of DUs that will be selected and idea any site obstacles that may need to be cleared for access to soil to the site in the DUs. We also note any special safety and health considerations that may need to be addressed and importantly test soil sampling tools we plan to utilize for sample collection. This is to make sure they will work efficiently during the site investigation. Also in our case when we are doing initial site discovery on historic sites we suspect may be contaminated Securing site access agreements with the landowners to schedule site visits can sometimes be very time consuming and must be coordinated well in advance of any site visits. Here's a list of some typical equipment utilized for surface soil sample collection for non-volatile contaminants using DUMIS procedures. Site clearing tools Anywhere from a hand sickle or scythe to heavy duty weed eaters or mechanical brush cutters can be critical on some sites as a sampler needs to have general access to the soil throughout the entire DU for the collection of stratified, or excuse me, systematic random soil sampling locations. Also, notice the variety of tools included on the list that could be used for so collecting soil. This is to cover any soil density or soil type or condition that may be encountered in one or more of the DUs in the investigation site. Bringing a variety of tools to address any situation that may be encountered helps to get the job done without the need for additional mobilization to the site. With some experience and the right tools, DUMIS samples can be collected in a reasonable time frame, approximately 30 to 60 minutes per DU, though this assumes the site is clear enough to navigate, soil is accessible, and you have pre-planned and located the DUs in the field. Typically, the biggest factor affecting sampling efficiency is the tools selected or available for sampling and how fast each increment can be correctly and consistently collected with that tool. Depth of soil collected in a surface soil DU is dependent on the investigation data quality objectives. This could be as shallow as zero to two inches if the focus is on, say, what a child may currently be ingesting from soil exposure during play in their backyard. But more typically, investigations of surface soils in Hawaii have targeted the zero to four inch or zero to six inch depth interval. I noted earlier the importance of an initial site reconnaissance visit during which a number of site features can be assessed and subsequently addressed that have the potential to slow down your soil sampling event. Such things as illustrated here, vegetation, various uh, uh, obstacles like uh, equipment, broken down vehicles, etc., pavement that's encountered, uh, rocks, uh, etc. Even with good advanced site review, unexpected events may arise that need to be managed to keep things on track. In our case, that has often ended up to be uh, animal control in the more rural areas, dogs, pigs, horses, and uh, perhaps curious neighbors. Hopefully the DUs you select will be clear to locate 
systematic random increments throughout and, and access the soil for sampling. If not, some clearing of dense brush or other obstructions may be necessary. Or you may have to break or drill asphalt or concrete pads to access the soil beneath if those areas are to be included in your contaminants average for that DU. Obviously, close coordination with and or help from the landowner is generally necessary for significant clearing operations. Remember that the representative average contaminant concentration determined from collecting a multi-increment sample in a DU can only be inferred across that entire DU if all areas in that DU are accessible to locate the systematic random sampling increments. Any portion of a DU that is not accessible because of, a, of say, a concrete asphalt pad, building, or a significant patch of dense vegetation is a data gap area that would then need to be addressed in, in the site investigation dis decision making. Oftentimes we deal with these with some sort of institutional control. We may assume it is contaminated uh, under a building if we find contamination up to the side of it or there could be contam other contaminants below the building. So we've got to note that in the site investigation, perhaps put in institutional controls in a final decision making document, noting that these areas uh, could not be sampled at the time. Assuming that a thorough phase one environmental site assessment or historical review of property being investigated has been completed and an initial site reconnaissance visit has been completed, proposed DU locations can be designated and drawn on aerial maps of the site before the sampling takes place. These can then be confirmed and adjusted as necessary during the sampling event. As shown here, for exposure area and source area DUs for a former sugar mill site, we typically use Google Earth images imported into PowerPoint to designate the location and dimensions of proposed DUs for the site and include planned increment numbers and spacing to utilize for each of the DUs. Planning ahead on DU selection and dimensions saves lots of time and effort in the field. Remember, the goal is to locate source and or exposure area DUs to gather adequate and representative site data to compare to applicable action levels as well as avoid having to sample yet again for characterization or remediation if possible. To lay out the plan DUs at the site, we typically designate the corners with wire flags and record GPS locations for these DU corners as necessary. In some cases, you may have land survey data or uh, physical measurements to fix landmarks to locate the DUs uh, for mapping purposes. We do not take GPS locations for each of the 30 to 100 increment locations within a DU as the target increment spacing and stratified, excuse me, systematic random approach is identified and described in the sampling and analytical plan. If you desire more documentation of specific increment locations within the DU, you can place wire flags at each increment and then take a photo. But we do not require such documentation in our guidance. This slide illustrates location of triplicate samples collected in one decision unit. True field replicates are required for all site investigations on a minimum of 10% of the site DUs. More field replicates could be required if the DUs have different target contaminants, soil types, or other significant variables across the site. If less than 10 DUs are designated on a site, then at least one field triplicate sample is required. In this example, the yellow X's mark the primary sample and the green and purple X's mark the replicate samples collected. And there'll be more on selecting replicate locations coming soon.
Here's an example of increment locations illustrated with wire flags in a small spill area, DU, next to a former transformer pad. The goal is to have the desired number of systematic random increments located approximately equidistant throughout the de decision unit. There are a number of ways of determining approximate increment spacing for each D DU including working it out in the field with measuring tapes and adjusting and readjusting wire flags as we first started out with. Over time though we learned to save time by estimating the planned increment spacing ahead of time and thereby keep any adjustments needed in the field to a minimum. This is an increment spacing estimation table in our TGM using the formula given below the table. However, it is not unusual to encounter situations in the field where the boundaries of, D, of DUs are irregular, which may require some additional field time to determine the best increment spacing to get complete coverage and to document these adjustments. The illustrations on the left side of this slide illustrate the goal to locate increments in a systematic random manner so that they are approximately evenly spaced throughout the DU in all locations. The illustrations on the right, which includes a simple random and a stratified random spacing approach, generally result in poorer, poorer reproducibility if the DU is sampled again than systematic random spacing. Using systematic random sampling, you select a random starting location and then sample at determined fixed spacing intervals across the entire DU. For very narrow DUs, such as along canals or drainage ditches, an alternate zigzag spacing approach may be needed as illustrated. In the field, we may locate these points by stretching a long measuring tape down the middle of the ditch with highly visible clips attached at the increment spacing distance, then use that as a guide when zigzagging down the DU. Some may be familiar with the VSP, or Visual Sampling Plan program, available online from the U.S. Department of Energy. And you may want to utilize this program as another option to estimate and designate increment locations within DUs. With this program, you can import GIS files of DU shapes, select from two grid options, input your target number of increments, and VSP will generate and illustrate potential increment spacing designs, and you can select the optimal increment spacing for your decision unit. Here is an example of increment spacing estimation using the VSP tool in both narrow and square shaped DUs. Using VSP may be especially useful for irregular shaped DUs where the increment spacing is not as easily estimated as for square or rectangular DUs. Field replicate samples, typically triplicates, are selected at separate systematic random increment locations across the same decision unit. So these are true field replicates, not co-located samples immediately adjacent to the primary sample collected as have been used with discrete sampling. These slides illustrate several approaches to selecting systematic random replicate sampling locations. On the left, the approach taken is to take a duplicate and triplicate sample from midway between the increment locations for the initial or primary sample in both directions. 
So if the round circles are your primary samples, the replicates are chosen midway, uh, systematically midway between uh, the, the primary sample and midway uh, in the other direction between the primary samples for your replicates. On the right, the DU has been separated into a grid pattern with the total number of grids equal to the number of increments targeted to be collected. So that would be anywhere from 30 to 100 uh, increments or grids for the DU. Within each of those grids, the three replicate samples are distributed in a triangular pattern equidistant from each other within that grid. Triplicate samples are typically collected all at once when moving across the DU with special care to keep each different replicate sample in their respectively labeled sample containers, usually a bucket or a bag, as illustrated in the lower right here. We have found that using long measuring tapes are very useful for expediting collection of increments at the designated increment spacing in a decision unit. This reduces the number of flags needing to be placed at measured intervals in the DU. We use wire flags just to mark the DU corners and then opposite sides of the DU where increment rows will be placed. A long measuring tape with colored clips placed at the designated increment spacing is stretched between the flags in a row to identify where each increment will be collected. So here are some colored clips. These can be placed, uh, if this is your measuring tape along the first row here, uh, there be uh, these colored clips located at the, uh, at the predetermined uh, set increment interval, spacing interval along that uh, tape. And then once you've gone through and collect your increments at all these uh, marked locations along the tape, you have uh, someone grab this end of the tape and someone grab that end of the tape and both move simultaneously over to here and place it on in this row location and then that those same marked locations are utilized uh, in this row to collect that and then once this row is completed, you move the tape over to the next row and collect increments at that same interval along that row. So, uh, and you would do that until all the increments in the, in the decision unit have been collected. Again, we found this is uh, speed things up other than, rather than um, marking each location with flags across the whole decision unit. Okay, now I'm going to run through a variety of field tools that have been employed in site investigations here in Hawaii to collect multi-increment multi samples. Some key points to remember about sampling tools in general, though. First, we are always trying to collect core-shaped increments to get a correct cross-section sample through the entire selected depth of the DU. A core shape is illustrated here. So uh, with a core shape, you're collecting all the particles through the entire depth of the decision unit, whether this be zero to two inches or zero to six inches or what have you. Uh, all those particles throughout the depth have, are, are captured equal chance of capture throughout the depth of the DU. If you're using something other than a core, say um, some sort of spade or scoop, you might end up collecting more of a V-shaped uh, increment, which is actually collecting, representing more of the particles uh, uh, at the top of your increment than it is at the bottom. And uh, the, uh, the, those particles might be differently contaminated than those, so you'd be uh, uh, not collecting a correct sample or not uh, getting a, a good reproducible sample of contaminant level for that increment. 
The sample coring device has to be large enough to collect a good size increment, typically 30 to 50 grams for a 0 to 4 inch or 0 to 6 inch, inch depth increment using, say, a 0 0.75 to 1.25 inch diameter core. However, if the core diameter is too large, then the total mass of the increments collected in each DU may exceed the capacity of the lab to process, uh, at least using standard processing procedures and their uh, typical processing fee. Generally, labs want the samples to be under two kilograms, but this may vary depending on the lab. Very large samples could require field subsampling, which adds significantly to the field effort. Another point is to always expect the unexpected and take a variety of sampling tools in the field so you can ensure you get the job done, even if like very dense, rocky soils are encountered. Test tools out on initial site reconnaissance, if at all possible, as I noted earlier. And it goes without saying, a superior tool for collecting correct increment cores will always save you time and labor. The, a simple agricultural trier coring devices, which has one side open that, that you can uh, use to uh, put a tool like a screwdriver in and, and pull out the core. Uh, works great in soft soils. It's really fast. Uh, you can grab your increment, uh, put it in your sample container, uh, punch out the uh, increment collected through the open side of the core, and move on. In some soft soils, may, you may be even be able to collect as deep as a 0 to 12 inch core and then split that in half to determine if contaminant levels decrease with depth, especially if the analysis shows that the, that the targeted 0 to 6 inch depth shows contamination over applicable action levels. You'll then want to uh, look uh, to see if uh, the lower uh, depths are, are contaminated above your action level as well. For surface soil samples, each increment from a given DUMIS sample are placed together in the sample container, typically a bucket or heavy-duty plastic bag. The sample coring device does not need to be cleaned between each increment collected within a DU, but must be cleaned between use in separate DUs. Here's what a typical bulk MIS sample looks like. Uh, as we mentioned earlier, typically uh, anywhere from between one to three kilograms. But uh, be aware that some labs will not take, take bulk multi-increment samples for processing, at least at a regular processing fee, that are more than 1.5 or two kilograms. So check with the lab you are using. If samples are too large for the lab to accept, you will need to representatively subsample in the field or perhaps pay the lab a special fee to subsample or process the large sample. This is an example of someone sieving and representatively subsampling in the field to, re to reduce mass of, of the samples to send to the lab. This should be avoided through good planning and tool selection if possible. It, it, doing this work in the field just adds additional sources of potential error in the sampling processing. I should also mention that wh whenever you're conducting subsampling in the field, reducing the mass of the sample, you'll, you'll also want to collect additional replicates of the subsampling process to demonstrate that your subsampling procedures of the bulk sample are representative of the entire bulk sample. So in this case, on the right-hand side, you'll see uh, different stratified random increments are being selected out of the spread out sample here to, to reduce the mass. Um, so for a replicate sample, you would go back in and collect the uh, sample 
the stratified random increments at different uh, locations throughout that sample uh, to create the replicate and send that in for analysis. You'd expect uh, that those two samples then would have similar concentrations if your uh, subsampling replicates uh, were representative. Here's an example of other uh, uh, coring tools that are available. There are, are uh, quite a variety out there. Uh, this one was developed by the Army Corps of Engineers and uh, used uh, heavily on military ranges. These have a coarse shaped increment on the bottom of them. And uh, it's nice because they have a, a bar on the top, top you can just step on. So you're, uh, it helps ensure that once you get that secure into the ground, you've got the similar depth inc increments at, uh, at, at every interval. I, it says in the slide here that it, you can go up to four to six inches deep. I've only seen these uh, with uh, collecting tips that are up to four inches deep. So uh, you might want to check that if you're uh, attempting to collect up to six inch uh, intervals. But the models I've seen have included different size uh, coring uh, tips so that you could uh, choose different uh, diameters for your, for your cores to collect. And uh, it's got a plunger, a metal plunger that will uh, poke out the sample um, after it's collected, which is convenient. Here's an example of a, a cordless drill with an auger bit utilized to um, bring up samples out of a core shape onto a, a, a plate at the surface uh, to collect your increments. This uh, this can be a fast and enticing method to use uh, in the field uh, compared to uh, more uh, laborious tools to use. And But I would caution you to uh, be sure and uh, test them out. You want to make sure that the uh, volume, the mass of soil bringing up in each increment is approximately uh, equal to what you would get uh, out of a, a, a push coring device. So w when we're wanting to use this uh, drill, uh, cordless drill method, I usually also bring along a core, compare the, uh, the volume or mass of soils coming out of these uh, uh, core using both, uh, both tools. Uh, to make make sure that you're getting good recovery with the drill. In some soils, it, uh, it just doesn't work that well, and you won't get much uh, recovery uh, or recovery that you might expect out of a core. So you want to test that. If it works, it's a, it's a, a nice technique and can be fast and and uh, easy on the back. In the illustrations there, we we've simply taken paper plates and cut a one inch hole in the plate and uh, put the drill down through or drill down through the hole in the paper plate and then as as you drill down to a designated depth it's bringing up that sample out of that uh, drill core on its veins up onto the uh, paper plate then that's uh, tossed in your sample container in this case the bucket there on the left Slide hammers are also uh, common to see uh, for soil core collection, which enables you to hammer the core down to a greater depth, uh, especially if you're trying to get down to a 12 inch deep uh, increment depth, which oftentimes people do, so they have the flexibility to, lo to look at both the zero to six and six to 12 inch intervals in, in the case that the surface uh, interval the topmost interval is contaminated above your action limits. So uh, it takes a little labor, but they're, uh, uh, they're useful, uh, very portable in the field, and, and widely used. Another uh, variation of this I've seen 
and have liked uh, to use on some sites is, is instead of the slide hammer uh, sliding up and down, there's a fixed hammer head on top of the coring device, and you just pound on the, um, the head with a, a small sledgehammer and uh, pound that down to the depth uh, you're attempting to reach. This slide illustrates other hand tools that uh, uh, may have to be resorted to in really dense, hard-packed, gravelly soils. We, we encounter these soils, these kind of soils, all the time in Hawaii, unfortunately. All these years we've been busting a lot of rocks and, and uh, a, a lot of these former commercial sites, these old sugar mill sites, etc., uh, pesticide mixing sites uh, where it had gravels spaced on them, heavy trucks traveling over them for many years. So the soil in these areas are, are densely packed, have a lot of gravel or, or, or their rock in the soils, and you literally need a pick to uh, bust into the soil. So typically these are they're used uh, blunt instruments they use to create a hole down in the soil to the depth of interest, and then we actually collect the increments. Remember, we always want to try to collect a core shape, so we, and once we get a hole busted in there with the, the uh, blunt tool, then we can go in on the sidewall of, of the open hole and, and collect a core shape incre increment with uh, uh, smaller tools. The bottom uh, breaker bar may be a good option if you need to uh, bust uh, asphalt or, or deteriorated asphalt to access the soil beneath. And here are illustrated a variety of uh, powered electric or cordless uh, spade or chisel bits that do the same thing, get you into really dense, hard packed soil that so you can then um, collect an increment uh, from the sidewall of, of the, the hole you've created. Here's an example of a uh, on a more remote site where we're bringing out a portable generator to operate the, the drills, uh, a chisel bit, so that we can drill holes. Again, this is a former pesticide mixing area where the soil is, is densely packed. We couldn't uh, get into it with a, a, a push corner, a push core or a slide hammer, so I had to use these um, more heavy-duty tools to get into the ground and then collect a core-shaped tool up the side of the hole that's busted in the best we can. And here, this, this slide il illustrates uh, what we're trying to accomplish once you get a hole using a uh, powered or hand uh, blunt instrument. You've got your hole uh, busted out to the depth uh, interval interest, and then you take a another tool, a smaller tool, to try to collect a core shape incre increment down the sidewall of that open uh, hole there. This is a lot of work, um, so, uh, you know, it's just the way it is on many sites. If you don't have access to some fancy drill rig, you just got to pound a mount. Stockpiles present a sampling channel challenge due to the lack of access to soil within the middle of the pile. Now remember the sampler must have equal access to collect stratified random increments in the entire DU, both laterally and vertically, to provide a representative sample for the entire DU. So if you come across a stockpile and sample just the, the top of the surface, even if it's all over the top of the surface, you're only representing what's in the uh, surface and something very different uh, might be present in the middle of the pile or at the base of the pile that you're not accessing. So the most common approach I, we've seen used here is to actually uh, just spread the stockpile out, spread it out, flatten it out, so that you can then access the entire depth of the, the stockpile or the now flattened stockpile with a coring device. And then you'd place your s systematic random increments throughout that flattened pile and collect your increments down through the depth of, 
of the stockpile. You could also, uh, another method that had been used is to actually move the stockpile from one location to the other util utilizing a, a front loader or some other operation and then take incrementally take samples out of each bucket as it's being uh, transferred from one location to the other to, to form your uh, 50 increment, uh, multi-increment sample if you were. Of course, you'll have to calculate the approximate number of buckets uh, and how many increments you'll take out of each bucket to um, determine uh, or plan out your increment collection for those DUs. But that uh, putting the material in, in mo movement allows you to access it and sam sample it that way as well. In some cases, especially where there's limited space, the stockpile is sampled in small portions that can be accessed, like a truck full, and a decision is made for that portion, then the next portion is sampled, and so on. Pits and trenches uh, can be approached with the use of mechanical equipment and it can be uh, that could be an efficient option if the site is open and the mechanical equipment is available. Once the trench is open, we're typically sampling one or more vertical increments up the sidewall of each depth interval in as near a core shape sample as we can. So in this illustration, there are two vertical layers targeted in in this. Um, trench. So again, in each, uh, each uh, these are two different decision, vertical decision units, and in each, each of these we would collect uh, increments along the sidewall at, at the uh, predetermined increment intervals, the number of increments you want to collect, and in this case, we typically always start at the bottom because uh, we don't want to start here and have the soil fall down and potentially cross-contaminate the bottom interval. So we sample this bottom in interval first and then go up and take the top interval sampling. Another approach is that, that you could actually use coring devices to sample a top layer down to a certain depth and then uh, as that depth lift is taken out, then come back with your coring device and sample the next lift, and after that's removed, sample down. That's another technique that could be used. I, I, I should mention that uh, trenching equipment has also been used effectively in larger DUs where multiple soil depths are being accessed and can be a, a good alternate to, say, using a push rig. In, in that case, a trench is dug to the appropriate depth along each of the plant increment rows in a DU, then the increments collected at systematic random locations from the trenches along the sidewalls in a core shape. Subsurface decision units, uh, where we're typically utilizing uh, drill rigs especially for larger and deeper subsurface inve uh, investigations, increases cost and complexity of the work. Uh, that's true uh, in any subsurface type investigations. In addition, because the drill cores are generally relatively large in diameter, two to three inches, and the DU depth intervals of interest can be several feet or more in depth, MIS or multi-increment subsamples must be collected from the larger mass of the core, which increases time in the field for this field processing of your samples. Also, if VOCs are targeted in the subsurface investigations, this presents additional challenge that must be well planned for to collect multi-increment samples from the cores into methanol and to closely coordinate the timing of core extraction and core opening by the driller in order to limit the time the core is on the surface and open before subsampling to prevent the loss of VOCs. Uh, 
Here's a uh, track mounted drill rig working to collect uh, cores on, on a site. Like other DUMIS investigation, the desired goal is to utilize a minimum of 30 cores in each subsurface uh, DU for characterization. And then you'll have uh, uh, a given number of vertical decision units, depending on how deep you're going and uh, how the length of your targeted uh, depth intervals as you're uh, going into the su subsurface. This is one open core with three DU uh, targeted DU depth layers uh, for a subsurface investigation. And each layer is subsampled separately and subsamples placed in their respective DU sample container. In this case, the, this, these are uh, being sampled for non-volatile contaminants. From each layer here, um, these uh, are subsampled and then put in uh, the collection bag for DU layer one. This is subsample put in DU layer two and DU layer three. Then the next of the 30 or more cores are brought up. Those same layers are uh, uh, exposed and subsampled and each respective layer is put in their respective sample containers to make up the bulk uh, multi-increment multi sample that will be sent to the lab. Combining the full 30 cores from each subsurface DU layer typically results in much larger combined increment mass for each DU layer than a lab could handle. So as I mentioned, field subsampling is commonly necessary to prepare MIS samples to send to the lab. Subsampling subsurface cores for non-volatile contaminants is generally not as complex as, as subsampling for VOCs. For a non-volatile contaminant investigation, Cutting a small wedge along the entire core length of the DU layer may be a good and fast option. However, if the soil in the core is rocky or very loose, regular spaced subsample plugs, like using a 5 to 10 gram plastic coring uh, device, every 2 to 6 inches down the length of the core of the DU layer depth may be the preferred method to subsample each core. In this case, the multi, multiple subsample plugs from the length of the specific DU layer represents one increment for that DU layer. If, if you're targeting volatile contaminants, the regularly spaced uh, small plug approach is selected to limit disturbance and exposure and minimize VOC losses. The subsampling plugs collected from two to six inch intervals along the uh, whatever the length of your DU layer uh, uh, core is, would be combined into a container of methanol large enough to hold the additional subsampling plugs from all other cores collected from that same DU layer depth. When coordinating VOC sampling, it is also critical to, uh, to ensure that the, you work closely with the driller so each core brought to the surface can be opened and subsampled by the sampling team in as short time as possible. Again, we're trying to minimize potential loss of VOC, so you want those cores processed as soon as they're, they're brought to the surface and opened up. This slide illustrates uh, a, a sampling a core for non-volatile contaminants along the length of the core. In, in this case, uh, this entire core was the depth of interest and they're taking a uh, utility knife-like uh, tool in this case, and, and the, the soil was uh, holding together well for that, and slicing a core, which is illustrated by this yellow core out of here, slicing a wedge out of the entire core length, and that becomes uh, the subsample for uh, this core. Again, we're attempting to reduce, reduce the overall mass of each core that goes into the multi-increment sampling, so you can send that to the lab and 
they, they can have a math that they can work with and process. Again, whenever you're subsampling, have to subsample in the field, uh, you'll also want to take replicates of your subsampling pro process. So these are different than the field replicates, which would be uh, additional systemat systematic randomly located cores throughout a, a specific DU. Uh, this, these are replicates of your subsample of the core. So if we wanted to do replicates on this core, we would take another wedge perhaps on this side of the core and another wedge on the opposite side of the core. So you'd have triplicate samples or three different wedges out of the same core. And again, we'd compare analysis results to ensure that uh, the, the data from the three cores uh, matched uh, appropriately, were, were appropriately precise, so that you know that your subsampling method for the cores uh, was representative. This illustrates uh, subsampling the cores with the uh, s small plastic uh, open-ended uh, coring device. These are typically 5 to 10 grams. And as I mentioned before, you would take these plugs at uh, various intervals along the length of your DU layer uh, to attempt to get a representative sample of the contaminant that's along the entire core. Typically that's uh, anywhere from two, every two inches to uh, every six inches, depending on uh, the degree of heter heterogeneity you might expect of the contaminants in, in those cores. So uh, when you're doing these uh, subsurface investigations for drill rigs, um, uh, there's an obvious increased cost of uh, uh, cost and effort to collect the subsurface samples, and in some cases, field triplicate samples uh, you know, may not be feasible due to timing issues or cost issues that come up. Uh, so if you're doing a triplicate cores in uh, for your subsurface layers, that would be 90 cores in, a, in the DU versus 30 cores, and that would be done in 10% of the DUs you're investigating. So uh, in the case that uh, 90 cores uh, triplicate samples uh, could not, uh, just could not be collected due to some limitation, then in that case, we'd encourage at least the collection of field duplicates versus triplicates. And that would be 60 cores and, and a DU versus 30 cores to help it evaluate the precision of the effort. Replicate sampling is really the only the way that you can uh, evaluate how precise the sampling effort was because contaminant heterogeneity can vary tremendously from, uh, at different sites with, for different chemicals, et cetera. So uh, we always collect replicates so we can better defend the data, data and uh, they're important in every investigation. In spite of that, we, we do come by situations where, uh, for one reason or another, uh, the inadequate number of field replicates or the, the ideal number of field replicates cannot be collected for some, some reason. In that case, you do the best you can and and uh, it's very important then to note the limitations of the data collection in any sampling reports and to consider those limitations uh, when, when making final site decisions. It may drive uh, more conservative final site decisions, obviously, if you don't have any replicates to know um, just how precise your, your data was. This slide uh, is illustrating uh, the, the lab subsampling process. And as we mentioned earlier, um, it's very important that the lab is following, uh, following up appropriately with your MIS sample because you don't want the lab to negate 
the wor all that work you've done in the field collecting your multi-increment sample by just opening up your large bag and taking a, a, a little bit of a little hit off the top of that bag and analyzing that because they they would not be getting a represent representative sample of what was in that um, large bulk sample. So uh, again, the procedure in the lab would be to initially uh, dry the samples. So they're dried out, uh, dried on large racks. Typically, the labs uh, that are uh, processing these samples are establishing uh, uh, dirty areas, or are certainly much dirtier areas than their instrumentation <laughs> rooms. Uh, they're usually in separate um, rooms, separate ventilation. They're spreading out the multi-increment samples um, across large trays, usually on racks, and drying them, uh, air drying them uh, before analysis. All our sample analysis need to be reported on a dry weight basis. Uh, so for non-volatiles anyway, a, a good way of accomplish that during processing is simply to air dry them before their subsample for lab analysis. These samples are air dried anywhere from, typically anywhere from overnight to a couple days, depending on how wet the samples are. And uh, periodically, the labs will go back, go into the sample and weigh, uh, weigh portions or the, weigh the entire sample to determine uh, that it's reached, reached dryness and is not losing weight with additional drying time. Once the sample is air dried, the entire bulk sample is then sieved to a known particle size. As we mentioned earlier, for we typically uh, sample or sieve all samples to the less than two millimeter particle size, which we define as soil particle size. And once that's done, we have a known particle size. The maximum particle size in our samples are less than two millimeter. And um, once you know the maximum particle size in your samples, you can then determine the minimum subsampling mass that's needed by the lab in order to reduce fundamental, fundamental error in the lab to a reasonable level. So any sample you send to a lab, the lab should be asking you what, um, how, you, how you want that uh, subsampled, um, and it's all based on the particle size. So if you don't sieve the sample, you don't know what the particle size is. So you're uh, shooting in the dark. You don't know exactly what mass uh, to analyze in order to reduce that fundamental error in the lab. So that's an important, uh, important feature. Also, uh, be aware that now in most cases we're looking where uh, a two millimeter particle size is just sorting out those uh, sticks and stones. It's pretty large uh, uh, particle size. But be aware if you're, if you're interested in something larger than two millimeters, that's gonna be a special case and you wanna make sure that they save that material from the, from the greater two millimeter. A good example might be if you're looking at in situations where there's large, uh, large particles like uh, lead pellets or something like that. You certainly want to know what lead pellets were in that larger sample, so you'd, you'd want to, in that case, you'd want them to uh, save all the pellets that were in the larger fraction, count them, weigh them, et cetera, so that you can consider that in your, uh, in your data and uh, risk assessment for the site. Uh, paint chimps might be another example if, the, if, if they make it, if don't make it through the less than two millimeter Sieve. So if you've got those situations on site, be sure and uh, make a note of that so the, uh, that you're telling the lab what they need to do with that. Once the samples are sieved, the entire bulk sample has to be processed. Once that entire bulk sample is sieved through your two millimeter sieve, or in certain uh, chemical specific cases, they might be sieving to even finer fractions, uh, like for lead, uh, or bioaccessible arsenic, it's typical to uh, look at, perhaps in addition to the two millimeter fraction, smaller size fractions. In any case, once the sieving is, is done, uh, 
that entirely sieve, the entire mass of the sieve sample is spread out again widely, typically no deeper than a quarter of an inch deep across the tray. And then the lab, uh, to take their lab subsample, typically for less than two millimeter sample, it's always at uh, a minimum of 10 gram samples. And they'll be using, doing just what you did in the field then. They'll be locating s systematic random locations across that spread out thin soil collecting those increments. They're using tools that are getting through the entire depth of the that narrow depth increment. So typically, as you see in the lower photograph, uh, square bottom tools so they can reach to the bottom through that layer down to the bottom of the, of the sampling tray to get um, the full depth of that layer at each one of the random increments. Obviously, these are very small increments because the total over at from all these increments are going to equal say 10, 30, 50 grams, something like that. So again, they'll choose their sample size to get their appropriate subsampling mass, their tool to get the appropriate mass. This, this tool here is simply a metal straw. And if some samples are very fine, ground very fine, you can actually use that like a coring device to put vertically into the the fine grain soil and, and core actually core it and it'll uh, stay up in if you put your finger on the top it'll stay in the in the core and then you can release that and collect your cores that way with with real ground or really fine grain samples so uh, that's the pre procedure of getting subsample and then your replicates would be collected again from the entire bulk sample, they go back again to the entire bulk sample remaining after the first uh, primary sample has been taken. Then they collect the sec the, their subsampling replicate from separate systematic random locations throughout this uh, spread out sample. And that would become your duplicate and or your triplicate in the lab uh, to look at variation in and how representative the lab subsampling data are to represent the entire bulk sample, the one to two kilograms that you sent them. I'd also uh, note that uh, it's common to see in, in lab protocols for uh, soil samples now, uh, lots of talks about they homogenize the sample before they analyze it. We, we don't use any of that lingo in our guidance because homogenize can oftentimes mean they, they open up a jar and they stir, stir around with a stirring rod or something like that, and then they take a hit off the top. All they're doing is increasing the, heter, uh, the heterogeneity of the contaminants in there because typically when you stir something in a container, the fines will go to the bottom and the larger particles stay to the top. So it's very important that um, you get away from this idea of homogenization. The way you collect a representative subsample is to spread it out thinly and collect these systematic stratified random locations throughout the depth of your layer in, that, in the entire bulk sample. That's how you're getting rep rep representative samples, nothing to do with homogenization. So I mentioned earlier uh, most of these points about uh, when you're looking at volatiles that we're generally um, using methanol. So you're putting uh, roughly equal weights of methanol for the, the uh, per gram of soil you're putting into that jar, and it's very essential that you uh, coordinate closely, of course, with the lab because the lab has to provide an adequate amount of methanol usually fairly large volumes uh, to accommodate uh, the, the multi-increment samples from numerous cores that are going to go into that uh, multi-increment sample in methanol. Here's an illustration of the larger uh, containers. You'll notice these are narrow mouth to reduce any potential uh, evaporation or loss of uh, methanol. Typically, when you're inserting your increments, usually these small plugs, got to make sure they fit 
into the mouth so you can uh, put them down in there. And uh, usually we're opening and closing the lid again to uh, reduce the potential loss of the solvent uh, during the procedure. Methanol is the preferred method for collecting MIS samples. Uh, most labs uh, consider that the gold standard amongst the options that are uh, noted in uh, method 5035. Uh, there are other uh, allowable sample preservatives in that option, but uh, we encourage the use of methanol whenever possible. Again, when the samples are uh, put into the methanol, then the VOC VOCs are immediately preserved there and captured, and uh, that's what we recommend. This is just uh, a photo illustrating uh, the, the setup, uh, the carefully controlled setup for sampling VOCs from cores. And um, here's uh, two workers working on a core, taking, uh, each one is taking separate random locations across the core to, to do replicates from this core and placing them in uh, bottles of methanol here. So um, again, I've mentioned very important to coordinate with the driller so the driller isn't stacking up dozens of cores sitting out in the sun <laughs> before they're opened up and you get to them to subsample. You want to have the cores come out of the ground when your samplers are, are ready to, um, to process that core as soon as possible. You want to collect these, these cores, get them into the methanol as soon as you as possible. Other way to uh, speed things up is to have multiple sample, sample teams or tables working on multiple cores at one time. So uh, th there are alternates to consider if uh, the, the methanol method in the field is uh, presents problems and Hawaii uh, is unique, uh, perhaps unique, in that um, we have work on all these different islands and uh, there are shipping regulations because methanol is, con is a hazardous material that limits uh, shipping certain amounts of methanol uh, air shipment uh, from island to island. So consequently, due to those shipping restrictions, some consultants have had to resort to collecting individual subsample cores or subsurface or cores from the subsurface in in sealed or vapor sealed uh, sampling small sampling tubes like an encore tube five to ten grams and shipping uh, these multiple cores all frozen to the lab that, that the lab would then thaw them out and combine them in methanol in the lab. Working in a uh, uh, sediment environment, uh, the same DUMIS uh, sampling procedures are involved. You just have to select tools uh, or use tools that are appropriate uh, to use in the water and uh, to obtain the, the sediment layer that, that is targeted here. So again, you would, uh, in the sediment environment, in which you're targeting here, you would identify your 30 uh, systematic random locations. You can have tapes and markers, flags along the sides of a, of a narrow uh, canal or something like this to help uh, mark in intervals and so that someone waiting in the water can use those as guides to um, locate samples as they're going along. In this case, we're sampling uh, an industrial canal, looking at the 48-inch depth, and a, a homemade tool was used in this case, simply a aluminum rod, a uh, hollow aluminum rod that's uh, affixed onto a PVC pipe so that it can be uh, put vertically down into the sediment, uh, and then you put a plug into the top, top of the core once it's in the sediment to help hold it in, pull it up, and collect the four to eight inch increment is what what we're shooting for here, and this is illustrating it was uh, the core is 
pushed out with a, a dowel onto a paper plate here to show that, that in this case a, a, a good core was able to be obtained with this, uh, this homemade device. Here's an example of using a uh, commercial coring device for uh, soil sampling in a, in a large estuary pond in the Hilo, Hilo area. This is the commercial core. It's about two, two and a half inches in diameter. Unfortunately, we weren't able to get it, find a commercial core in a much um, smaller diameter, uh, which would have been preferable uh, for, for our use. But it, it had a uh, valve in the top of it that once you pressed it into the soil and, and pull, pulled it up, the valve would close to help uh, vacuum-wise hold the sample in the coring tube as you're pulling it up out of the water. The platform we sampled out of was, a, was just a small skiff, a flat bottom skiff that was reasonably stable. And you can see here, we're, uh, in this case, we're, we're trying to pound down uh, the the core down further in the sediment so that we can obtain at least uh, 12 inch cores out of each one of these cores. We set up different five or six decision units throughout this large estu estuary, about a 30 acre estuary, and collected uh, 30 cores at systematic random locations throughout the, the each DU. The increment locations in this case were, were located using a handheld GPS to uh, locate the points in the water. After the cores were collected, you'll see they're all uh, collected in the boat, brought up to a, uh, this commercial device had a, uh, uh, a s simple splitting device that you could attach onto the bottom, push the core up from the bottom, and then uh, slice off the core at any um, uh, specific interval you wanted to. In this case, we chose uh, the layers of interest as 0 to 4 inch, 4 to 8 inch, 8 inch to 12 inch. The contaminant of interest in this case was arsenic. There was arsenic wastewater dumped into this pond uh, for many years. Typically, uh, with these commercial devices, you, uh, this, this pond at high water was about 12 feet deep. So typically there are uh, commercially coring devices that you can employ in, in waters um, easily up to about 15 to 20 feet deep. Once it gets deeper, then you're, we're looking at uh, different challenges and, and uh, different tools. And obviously as you get deeper, it's potentially uh, costly or slower, more time consuming to, to collect um, uh, cores in a given decision unit we'd still be sh uh, shooting or using the same principles applying to uh, s sediment uh, in deeper water. Once the uh, increments were collected out of this pond, uh, as I said, the core diameter was uh, quite large, two to three inch in diameters, so we couldn't just collect the each uh, four inch increment and combine those 30 increments and send that to the lab because the mass was much larger. This is about a two gallon bucket and you can see how th those samples were about two gallons, which was too large for the, our sample to, uh, for our lab to process. So we spread the sample out very thinly and used, uh, in this case, plastic uh, paint scrapers to subsample uh, systematically, randomly, in this case, kind of like in a checkerboard fashion throughout the depth of that interval. And we created three uh, subsampling uh, replicates uh, out of each bulk sample here. And that got each, each uh, uh, subsample down to a gallon size that we could send to the lab for processing. Finally, I want to just quickly go over um, use of field screening device in the context of DU MIS investigations. Like EPA and other uh, bodies, uh, the Department of Health here in Hawaii supports the use of field screening devices to uh, streamline or, uh, 
expedite site investigations. In our case, the common, the common contaminants uh, that we're looking at here, some of the most common contaminants are uh, lead and, and arsenic, sometimes mercury, and we can use a uh, field portable uh, screening device, uh, an, a field portable x-ray fluorescence or XRF device to uh, screen for, for these metals. So uh, there's been a number of cases where they've, these have been put to good use in investigations that combine both the use of these field screening device and, and multi-increment sampling. The way that, that we prefer to collect uh, samples for XRF measurements when we're going to a site and initially screening it for uh, for metals is to actually go out to your uh, selected DUs like you would go out and collect a surface soil sample, put it in a, a plastic bag, a large plastic bag so it can be spread out thinly, and then uh, take your XRF readings through the plastic. You typically take these through a plastic bag anyway, uh, and uh, instead of just one discrete sample you might do if you were doing this in the field, then for this, uh, this multi-increment sample you've collected to represent the surface layer in your chosen DU, you can uh, sample this uh, a great number of times in the bag and average them to get uh, what we think is a better re representation of what might be in, in that decision unit. So we might uh, take 10 to 20 uh, XRF readings on, on this side of the bag, then flip it over, take another 10 to 20. Uh, these readings are recorded and we can average those readings then, uh, these 20 or, or more readings of the XRF to come up with a screening value and, uh, or, or a, a screening number for the metal of interest uh, for that, that decision unit. We found that these have been used to, to uh, great effect in initial screening uh, efforts, especially things like uh, large surveys of looking for lead around water tanks, looking for lead arsenic around uh, building foundations where you might expect them as an initial investigation just to see if there's um, any significant contamination there. Then if you get uh, significant readings, um, you can come back then and and use those readings and that data to lay um, to lay out decision units and uh, collect those for more precise confirmation sampling. Of course, we're assuming in all this that the operator is very familiar with the operation of their instrument and appropriate calibration is maintained. Some, in some cases, you want field-derived uh, spiked standards uh, to test. And uh, we found that the more familiar the operator is with the instrument, of course, the more reliably they can be used and interpreted. This is uh, an example you've seen before, and Roger mentioned it the other day, of where an XRF was used to take a fairly dense grid of sampling points. And each, at when each of these points, these, uh, these were actually uh, from a one meter area and five point uh, uh, readings from the XRF. So these are not just one discrete XRF reading from these locations, but a little bit more rigorous um, XRF determinations from each one of these points or averages. And from, th from that data, you can definitely see where the heavily contaminated area of the site was. And it's outlined here in red. and um, Th this was excellent. It uh, provides a good initial data, enough for you to use this data to start follow-up actions and planning for removal, planning for uh, uh, capping, whatever uh, approach might be taken. Uh, however, there were uh, some outlier liar points here. That is less clear of whether they're really representative. Probably not not a big contamination here, but. Um, uh, nonetheless, uh, that's the hazard of using a dis discrete sampling method is that you'll get these artificial cold spots or hot spots and you don't quite know how to interpret them. Consequently, 
we don't use field, the field instru instrument for the final final uh, decision making. So in, the, in this case, we would advocate the approach using the field screening device to focus in. These are our high, more highly contaminated areas, so we located smaller decision unit sizes here and would advocate uh, sampling from these smaller decision unit sizes first here with the UMIS procedures and, and also an attempt to locate smaller here to get a more precise boundary be between the areas that may be contaminated and maybe not. And, and as you go further out, we'll, we would increase the size of the decision units here, perhaps to the decision, the lot sizes that are proposed for the future development and, um, and test those with our DUMS for confirmation sampling before the final decisions or the fi final site clearance is given for uh, the work on this site. By the way, this was uh, uh, arsenic contamination from our pes former pesticide mixing. The most concentrated areas arsenic levels were over 10,000 part per million of soil in that area of the site. Last slide, this is just uh, going over some of the common issues or what, what we're calling here DUMIS investigation mistakes or problems that we've talked about. I just wanted to point out here, uh, as you look down this list, you'll hopefully recognize uh, points that we've made throughout these uh, webinar series about these issues. Uh, and. Th and I wanted to note that within our technical guidance manual, there's a specific section um, in, I, I believe it's in section four, that covers these uh, common DUMIS investigation issues in more depth. So each one of these, th there's more detail given. And it's a good way to um, take advantage of the, of the experience we've had here in Hawaii on on um, uh, common pitfalls or issues that we see on a site that where that can be improved when you're attempting to uh, apply the UMIS sampling approach on sites. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. That's it. Thanks, John. The questions that we received at this webinar and Answers and notes are posted to the HERE webinar page, so refer to the HERE webinar page for details on that. Following after this slide are a series of slides on each of the common problems and mistakes that John just briefly discussed. See section 4 of the TGM for additional details on this. There's no audio associated with these slides. Just to, we'll spend a few seconds on each one and then move to the next ones.